Yeah, Josh is uh, one of the most experienced riparian ecosystem adaptive management modelers on the planet. Uh, he got his uh, master's degree in oceanography at UBC back in the 1980s and then uh, went to work as a private consultant, never even tried to go to government and worked on all sorts of uh, eco riparian system problems on different river systems and so on with me and others, developing software f to aid in adaptive management planning. In the in the in around 1996, I think it was, Josh scored big with a, a major contract with the U.S. Geological Survey to develop uh, to help develop adaptive management plans for the riparian ecosystem in the river and so on in the Grand Canyon in Colorado. Uh, that led him to not just do a lot of modeling work, but to do develop a major field program uh, collecting. Uh, that he'll be describing today, collecting data on rainbow trout uh, in the canyon. And that program continues to this day. So he spent a huge amount of time, both as a modeler and in the field, and not just in the Grand Canyon, but in a lot of other places like developing uh, adaptive management plans for BC Hydro's operations here in BC, uh, developing uh, really nice uh, analyses of uh, coho and steelhead population dynamics and just a wide range of things that he works on as a consultant. You can uh, look him up. Uh, he runs his little consulting companies called Ecometrics and uh, it has a list of all the amazing things that Josh has done over the years. Doctor, oh, yeah, I forgot to say that in the midst of this Grand Canyon thing, he parlayed his uh, his field work in the canyon into a PhD here at UBC as well. Dr. Corman. Uh, thanks, Carl. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here virtually and to um, get out of my pajamas before noon, at least <laughs> from the waist up. So I'm going to talk about the effects of drought and climate on uh, somatic growth rates of, of trout in the Colorado River and, and the profound effect those growth rates have on the abundance of that population in terms of how it varies through time and how it varies through space. Um, and this, if you're more interested in this, this is part of a, um, most of this comes from a, a paper that's impressed in ecological monographs. Okay, next, all right. So this work is done in the first 130 kilometers downstream of Glen Canyon Dam. So the dam impounds Lake Powell, which is the second biggest reservoir in the States. You're only seeing a tiny bit of it in that map. Um, the first 25 kilometers is uh, what's known as Glen Canyon, and it's a clear tailwater. It's highly productive for trout. It supports uh, a blue ribbon fishery, and that's where most of the juvenile recruitment and spawning occurs. And then the Perea River enters 25 kilometers downstream for the dam. It puts in occasionally large amounts of fine sediment, which makes uh, the section downstream from there, highly turbid on occasion. And then down at the LCR, or Little Colorado River, shown here, um, there's additional sediments input that come in. So we're interested in what determines the abundance of trout through this 130 kilometer section. Up here, we want large trout um, to support the fishery. Down at the confluence, we're interested in keeping trout abundance very low because uh, humpback chub enter this uh, blue water tributary, they spawn there, the juveniles disperse into the main stem where the water is clearer and colder due to the impoundment from the dam and where trout densities are occasionally higher and this reduces their survival and growth rates. So what controls the dynamics of trout and their abundance down here and up here is really what we're interested in and this system provides a lot of nice contrast. You've got clear water up top, turbid water down here, more turbid water down here. You've got increasing temperatures as the water warms downstream. You've got very trout densities up here, lower trout densities down there. So there's a lot of biotic and abiotic contrast over space and time that's really going to allow us to tease out some interesting aspects of, of growth and population dynamics. Um, so here's a conceptual model that, that covers what we're going to talk about in this talk. So we're interested in the abundance of trout, both over space and time, shown at the top of this graph. Um, we know recruitment, uh, the, the, the dominant paradigm for freshwater or fish population in general, it's variation in the recruitment rate of juveniles 
to the adult population that regulates abundance, and, and we know from other systems that the growth rates of those pre recruitment really important to that, to positive recruitment. And, and I'll show that in this study. Um, lesser appreciated are the effects of somatic growth on maturation schedules and of course fecundity. If you've, if you've got a higher percentage of the population maturing, that's gonna feed into greater recruitment. And perhaps the least appreciated effect is how poor growing conditions can actually lead to sudden reductions in the survival of adults. And that can have an immediate effect on abundance. And there's a, this, this talk shows a striking example of that. So growth then, at least in this system, somatic growth, fundamental driver, regulating population abundance. So we're quite interested then in what is regulating somatic growth. And of course, it's gonna be a function of how much prey there is, water temperatures that affect fish metabolism, and things that affect a fish's ability to see prey in this system being turbidity. So the, there's two key bottom-up drivers that are affecting growth and therefore abundance in this system. One is floods from the Perea and the LCR, and the other are inflows into Lake Powell. And at the end of the talk, we'll start, we'll, we'll discuss those a little bit. Um, I gotta do this. So there are, are two major influences in this paper. The guy in the upper left is my colleague, Mike Yard, been a long-term biologist working below Glen Canyon Dam. And about the time that Carl Walters showed up, there, there he is in the late 90s in the lower picture, um, I was becoming increasingly frustrated with our inability to answer some basic management questions. In this case, on inability to understand what was driving trout abundance. And so he said, damn it, I'm gonna go out and get some good data and essentially was the one who designed the program I'm gonna speak of. And his intuition, which I, I didn't really buy at the beginning, was that the growth rates, somatic growth rates were a fundamental driver of trout abundance in the system. Carl's had a big influence on this paper, like as a student of his, um, a colleague, you know, his influence on bioenergetics and growth and population dynamics throughout my career, but in particular on this paper, um, valuable. And um, we went down in the late 90s to work on the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program. It was like Carl's assistant there. And I, I'm struck by an early meeting there where he sat in front of all the, you know, the luminaries that worked down there at the time and told them basically that their data was shit, meaning it wasn't sufficient to answer the management questions or build a model that could predict the effects of management action. So Carl, I think in part this, this talk is like saying, well, here's some data that's not shit and that could potentially like um, address some of these questions that we were posing 20 years ago. So uh, the sampling design basically consists of sampling in five reaches shown by these black boxes with more intensive work done in the Glen Canyon reach. And we visited those six kilometer uh, reaches generally um, every three months for five years between 2011 and 2016. We continue to sample in Glen Canyon. To date, we've pit tagged over 173,000 rainbow trout. Um, and from that, we are able to, uh, we've in this talk, there'll be 10,000 observations of, um, recapture observations basically, um, that allow us to estimate growth rates, movement within and among reaches, uh, recruitment, survival, and abundance, right? Um, so, the two principal sampling methods we use are nighttime boat electrofishing to capture trout, and these fish are then brought to the central processing location where they're tagged in weight and such and brought back to their location of capture. And we also put some effort into sampling uh, the drift, the benthic drifting benthic invertebrates, which are the principal prey item for trout using these plankton nets. So, the von Berlepe model is, is a basic model where you use to, to predict and estimate growth rates. You're all familiar with this equation. And um, the typical way we, people think about it is that the von Berlepe model predicts length as a function of time at large or age. And as fish get older and bigger, their growth rate slows and eventually uh, these fish at a terminal age sort of stop growing and, and that's the asymptotic length. But you can really think of this curve as a, as a, that's the integral. And there's a series of increments as you work along. So with tagging data, 
you could catch a fish, let's say 30 centimeters at, at, in year one, catch it a year later at 40 centimeters empirically, then you'll know that that 30 centimeter trout grew 10 centimeters a year. And as you can see by this curve, that growth rate declines as fish get larger. And the tagging data allows us to basically estimate the relationship between growth and length, which is shown here in this plot, theoretically. So as, as, as the fish size increases due to greater metabolic demands and such, the growth rate declines. Um, the original Von B formulation is shown right up there in the title part. And, and, and basically it's, it's, it's predicting the change in length per unit time as a function really of two terms. And so this can be rearranged as a really simple linear regression model where there's an intercept and a slope. And the intercept determines the, um, you know, the vertical position of that line and the slope determines how rapidly uh, growth rates decline with increasing fish size. And when those growth rates decline to zero, you have an empirical estimate of the asymptotic size. And if you center that length estimate, the length data for any fish, i.e. have it be zero at the mean size, then the intercept reflects the growth rate for an average size fish, which is what we'll do here. So the beauty of using a linear model, and there's a couple of functions in fisheries like the Von B model and the Ricker function that actually can be linearized. And, and one of the advantages there is then there's a whole bunch of really familiar statistical machinery that you can use to analyze those relationships. And so here we're using mixed effects models to determine what is driving the intercept and slope in that growth and length model. So we've got about 10,000 recapture records in one of five reaches over three month time intervals for 18 intervals over five years. So that growth rate in, for any fish in any reach at any time is gonna be predicted based on this intercept and slope where the intercept and slope are predicted through a series of fixed effects, right? Like of discharge or temperature or prey and as well as random effects. And this is done uh, for both the intercept and the slope. And it's important to get the random effects if you're, if you're interested in the variance and model selection and such, um, because they account for pseudo-replication. And for the growth and weight model, we're gonna use uh, Walters and Essington bioenergetics model, which basically says that the growth rates are simply a difference between energy intake, less losses due to metabolism, right? And there's these, these two terms, net energy intake and net metabolic loss, which are kind of equivalent to these B0 and B1 terms. Um, and so we'll also model those terms as um, uh, ran, uh, mixed effects. Let's look at some data. Plots on the right show growth in length. Plots on the, so, uh, on the left show growth in length and on the right growth in weight. And we're looking at two of 18 intervals here, April to July and July to September 2014, um, in only one reach in the middle of Marble Canyon. So this is about two or 3% of the data that's involved in this estimation. And you know you can see some obvious things, right? That April to July had much higher growth rates for the average size fish compared to July to September. Um, the asymptotic length there, what is that? About 275 and maybe uh, 250 in, in the poorer growing month. Um, we can actually see some negative growth in length. Fish can shrink a bit when they starve uh, beyond our observation error. Uh, the Walters and Essington kind of uh, model can be nonlinear, which is fundamental for modeling growth. And you can see how seriously low the growth rates can be. So for example, a 200 gram fish can lose 15 grams a month. So over, you know, this three month interval, right? That's like, let's say 40 grams on a, on a 200 gram fish. That is a significant amount of weight loss. Um, and, and we'll see the effects of that. So let's look at the uh, coefficients. Um, in terms of the things, the, the variables that are controlling growth rates. And the left graph is growth in length, right graph growth in weight. Let's focus on the left and let's focus on the intercept, which is a growth rate of the average size fish, and that's the black points. So the covariates are standardized. So the bigger the coefficient, the stronger the effect. And so we see that reactive distance, which is basically the, the ability of a trout to see its prey from further away which is determined by water clarity. The clearer the water, the greater the growth rate. The higher the competition, the lower the growth rate. The higher the prey densities, the higher the growth rate. That all makes sense. And those are the three dominant factors. But it's a little harder to get around 
is this coefficient, the slope shown by the red points. So because there's a negative in front of that coefficient, a bigger value means there's an increasingly negative effect of increasing fish size on growth. So why would higher prey densities lead to an increasing negative effect of fish size on growth? Same for reactive distance. I'm gonna come back to that question. Doesn't make, an, it's not very intuitive at first, but the reason it does that is quite interesting. Relationships on the right is just the growth in weight model. You see the basic same pattern, reactive distance, greater water clarity, better energy intake, black point, um, higher competition, lower energy intake, higher prey, greater energy intake. And you've got the metabolic losses following again, strangely, that same pattern. Um, I'll explain that uh, in the next slide. But the other thing to point out here is that water temperature. The higher the water temperature, the greater the negative metabolic loss, which makes total sense from a physiological perspective. So why this correlation among these parameters? And this is something, if you worked with Carl for a while and you see him staring at the computer screen, twisting his hair, twisting his beard, he did a lot of that looking at these plots. And what they show is you take the prediction of the, of the intercept and the slope, let's say in this left plot, or the intake and the metabolic loss, the right plot, if you take that prediction for every reach and every time interval, you end up with 90 points. And you can clearly see that these parameters are highly correlated. And this is not a statistical artifact associated with you know, the correlation between an intercept and a slope. This is a real effect as shown by the fact that the high growing seasons, in terms of good growth rates for the average size fish, which typically occur in the spring, also have bigger penalties on the increasing effect of fish size on reduced growth, right? So why, why is that correlation occurring? And, and, and Carl, we were you know, quite interested in that factor. And it's really quite apparent in the data so if we go back and look at the length data, growth and length for those two intervals, and let's look at this lower growth period between July and September, when the water was turbid, fish couldn't see their food, they grew slower. So a 200 millimeter trout or was growing at about two millimeters a month, three millimeters a month, while in the springtime when the water was clear, it was growing at eight millimeters a month. So that was a four-fold increase in the growth of the average size fish. But look at the asymptotic length. It's going from like 240 at, in the low growth period to about 280 in the high growth period. So there's not much of an increase in the asymptotic length under better growing conditions. But there's a big increase in the growth rate for the average size fish. So the only way for the model to fit that data is as you increase the, the growth rate for the average size fish, the intercept, you have to increase the slope of the line to fit the asymptotic length because the asymptotic length hasn't increased that much, right? So basically the issue is that the asymptotic length is not changing very much in relative to the growth rate of the average size fish, and that's causing that correlation between the intercept and the slope. And the reason that covariate parameters follow each other is if you have a covariate like turbidity or reactive distance, and, and, and the, the prediction is when the water's clear, you get a lot increase in growth of the average size fish, you the, the, the parameter that can, the, with respect to turbidity that controls the slope of that curve also has to change to steepen up that slope. So basically, the, uh, these correlations are really, at least in this case, a diagnostic of uh, the asymptotic size not changing as much as the growth rate for the average size fish, or energetically for weight, it's basically the, uh, the metabolic, yeah, a similar type of thing where the asymptotic mass isn't changing as much as the growth rate for smaller size fish. And so then the question is, why does that occur? And um, what is limiting asymptotic size and causing this correlation among parameters? And it's basically the type of food that's available there. So for trout in Grand Canyon, there's three things they eat, midge larvae, black fly larvae, and pupae. Um, which are very small critters, and gamerous, which is an amphipod, which is a much larger energy-rich type of particle. So as trout get bigger, their, their metabolic costs increase, 
and their cost of foraging increases because they've got to move their bigger body off the bottom and swim hard to get that little prey item. If those prey items are small and, and therefore not much energy in them, the cost of foraging um, is not made up by the benefit of getting that item. And so at a certain point, you're basically, the prey are too small to grow beyond a certain size, right? And, and Mike Dodrell, one of the authors of this paper, you know, used a formal bio, you know, bioenergetic model where one, you know, pretends one, one uses estimates of, of metabolic costs and foraging costs. When you do the math in the computer, he fed it different size spectrums of critters and found that with the size spectrum we have there, it's not surprising that the asymptotic size is so limited. Now, trout in Grand Canyon used to be a lot bigger. And, and we've always thought, um, Carl and I, that that reduction is due to high densities. But I would argue here that the reduction is really due to a decline in this high energy gamorous uh, food type, right? And, and it, because of its decline, it's led to a reduction in the asymptotic size. Competition plays into it, but so does particle size. And there's two ways it affects things. As you'll see, there's significant weight loss during parts of the year. And that's occurring because midges and black flies, which are the dominant food supply, they're only abundant in the spring and summer due to their short lifespans and um, springtime reproduction. Gamorous used to be are abundant year round, their longer life cycle, but um, they're now much less abundant. So the trout are dependent on this, you know, seasonally variable particle um, that's causing them to lose weight. So when they get to the next growing season, they have to put half the energy gains in the growing season just to recover from their lost weight rather than adding new weight. And I think the gamma is, is, is a big part of that dynamic. So let's look at the seasonal and interannual patterns in growth, or this is like a 30 centimeter trout uh, in Middle Marble Canyon. And the colors represent the growth uh, over different times of year uh, in terms of growth and weight per month. And so you can see that in the spring, uh, the green box, you know, you've, you've got high growth rates and um, that leads to a high condition factor, the plumpness of a fish shown by that black line. So during periods of high growth in, in winter and spring in Marble Canyon, you have, you end up with high condition. Then you go into the summer and fall, growth rates become negative. So you lose condition, right? And you get to 2014 and you notice that the growth rates in that winter and spring were really depressed. And so you don't get much of a recovery in condition. Then you go into the next summer and fall where, the, where you're losing a lot of weight and the condition declines dramatically, right? And when you have an average condition factor less than 0.8, that's just a whole bunch of super skinny fish that I'll show you that will actually lead to death by starvation or, or disease following due to starvation. Um, so that's the seasonal pattern. And if we look at that a bit more broadly, it's a complicated slide here, but what you're looking at in these panels is upstream, middle of Marble Canyon, and downstream. And the upper panels are small trout, bigger panels are large trout. And if you just kind of stand back, you can see that as you work your way from upstream to downstream, there's a lot more seasonal variation in growth and condition. Notice these fish downstream of the LCR can actually grow a lot better than they do in Glen Canyon. Um, because fruit availability is higher down there and densities are low. But there's also these growth depressions that occur um, that are greater, and that leads to greater variation in condition factor and lower levels. And as a, for bigger trout, you can see that that variation seasonally is even greater. Note the, um, and that there is a, uh, a real, you know, really, really prolonged periods of weight loss. So now let's ask, what is driving that seasonal and, and spatial variation in growth rates? And so here I'm just going to plot the additive effects from the model. So that's just, a, that's just the coefficient of each covariate times the value of that covariate. So we're looking at the L LCR inflow reach for one interval, April to July 2012. And these colors represent the effects of the different covariates. So, so um, the brown is positive, meaning the water was clearer than normal. That led to better growth. Competition was beneficial because it was low down at the LCR inflow reach. And food was much higher than normal. 
And so that led to positive growth. And the negative contributor growth was water temperature. So because the positives add to more than the negatives, growth is positive. That means fish gained weight and condition over, these period, over this period. If I step then to the next time period, here we can see that there's a lot more negative things than positive things. So fish lost, the fish lost weight and condition during this period. And we can see that there's a substantive negative effect of water clarity. So this is the summer monsoon season. The Priya and the LCR are running. It's turbid, reactive distance is low, and the model predicts it has a big negative effect on growth. So we let this play out for the first three years of the study. It's a little complicated, but, and the orange line is showing the trend and condition factor. You can now see what's driving the seasonal and interannual variation in growth and condition. So you've got high prey availability in the spring and summer, but growth in the summer is limited due to high turbidity, you get a and so condition factor declines. You get a recovery in that condition because you've got elevated growth in the spring of 2013 due to really high prey availability and no turbidity issues, leading to a recovery in condition, right? Again, you drop condition due to the monsoon, which is going on in the summer and the fall of that year, so you end up in a little worse shape. And spring of 14 rolls around, notice the lack of high prey availability, right? Um, and so because of that lack of high prey, you're, you don't have the same positive growth rates, your condition doesn't recover, so you're starting from a low place, and then you enter in the monsoon season in 2014, and you've got significant you know, water clarity issues in both uh, the summer and the fall. You've also got much water warmer temperatures in that year, and that's also having a penalty on growth. So the basic, it's kind of like a one-two punch here. You've got low availability in the spring, followed by high turbidity and warm temperatures in the summer and fall that basically drove that condition to really low levels that resulted in a population collapse. Okay, this is a ridiculously complicated graph, but if you stare at it from a 10,000 foot level, it really, it makes sense and it really describes what's controlling growth over time and space in this system. So three panels, three columns are upstream to downstream and the upper panels are big, small fish, lower panels, small fish. And you can see Glen Canyon, right? There's kind of, if you think of this as a hockey player's mouth, this guy hasn't had his teeth punched out too much. He's got pretty even growth rates, right? The, the positives are, are, are balanced by the negatives. Um, you can see in Glen Canyon, the negative factors are high competition and low food. Glen Canyon actually has lower prey uh, drift densities than downstream. The beneficial things in Glen Canyon are clear water and cool temperatures. The water hasn't had time to cool. If you go downstream, you get that more beat up hockey player look, right, with big holes here and there caused by these growth rate depressions, which are being driven largely by tributaries, right? tributary sediment input. You get down below the LCR, where now you've got two tributaries to deal with, and those uh, water turbidity-driven growth rate depressions are more frequent and larger, and you can begin to see more important negative effects of water temperature because the water's moving as it goes downstream, so temperature becomes more important as far as a limiting factor, especially for larger fish, right, where the penalty on metabolic costs is greater, right? So it's kind of a, a pretty neat diagnostic there to sort of describe what's controlling somatic growth. So then the next part of this talk is really like, what are the effects of this growth on the, on the abundance spatially? So what you're looking at here are Jolly Seabird based estimates of abundance in each of the reaches across the 18 trip interval or 19 trips. And um, you know, they're size stratified, but really you can just focus on the total height of the bars and you can see that between September 14th and April 2015, we had major reductions and rapid reductions in the abundance of all populations, ranging from a threefold reduction to as high as tenfold downstream of the LCR. And in Marble Canyon and at the LCR, those abundances remained low for this period and they continue actually to this day. So I'm gonna argue here that all these changes are fundamentally driven by somatic growth rates. So the first thing that was a real surprise to us 
is a relationship between condition factor and survival rate. So we, the Jolly Zebra model allows us to estimate the apparent survival rate in each one of these reaches on each trip interval. And we know the condition factor of the fish, um, uh, the average condition factor at the start of each of those intervals. And what we see is that the lower the condition factor, the lower the estimated survival rate. And that pattern um, is especially dominant in larger sized fish, which were the big part of the population collapse. And you can see that when we had low condition factors in September 14 and January of 15, that's when we had those low survival rates that caused the population collapse. So that was the cause of the immediate reduction. What kept that population at low levels? Well, that was really due to limited recruitment. Um, most of the recruitment occurs in Glen Canyon. So the first thing we did in Marble Canyon, once you wiped out the fish in Marble Canyon, there weren't many fish in there to trickle down to the LCR. So that reduced immigration to the LCR. With the recruitment stayed pretty low in Glen Canyon because the condition factor of fish in 2015 was really poor due to the conditions I've described. And if we look at the proportion of that population that matures, and we can index that based on squeezing fish and looking at the proportion that express gametes, a really crude measure. Nevertheless, it shows that when fish are in poor condition energetically, of course, they're investing less in reproduction. And so there's a lower rate of maturation to the population, and that's going to limit recruitment. And of course, the fish will be smaller and lighter, and they're going to have less eggs, right? And so growth is definitely affecting recruitment, which is keeping um, the population down. Uh, and this is shown here. Uh, we estimate the recruitment, uh, particularly in Glen Canyon, um, and that's the, uh, the z-axis here. And we see that when we have higher condition of, of spawning sized fish in the fall, we tend to get an increase in recruitment among the years. And um, this growth rate is for the smallest fish that we tag, 75 millimeters. And that we're using that here as an index for the growth rates of the pre-recruits, basically fry, small fry. And um, as that growth rate increases, um, their, their survival rate likely increases. And that's why we tend to see a positive relationship between growth rate and recruitment. So we'll come back to the conceptual model now. I think we've shown some pretty good linkages within the constraints of time about how growth is a fundamental driver of abundance. Competition, still important though, in terms of allowing growth to recover um, once the population's kind of collapsed in the absence of increased prey. But what I wanna focus on now really is the two things that are dr bottom up drivers. And it's the intensity of summer monsoons and the frequency that determine the, um, the, the magnitude and frequency of floods from pre and the LCR that affect turbidity, that affects reactive distance, and ultimately growth, and the effects of um, basin scale hydrology. Since 2000, we're in what's called the 21st century drought. And this is uh, one of the two biggest droughts in the last 1500 years. And it's characterized actually as a hot drought because although precip has been lower, um, what's really unique about it is the fact that the air temperatures are so much warmer. So this is leading to more precip falling as rain rather than snow, a lot more evapotranspiration, a lot more evaporation from the reservoirs, and a lot more sublimation of the snow. And so all that is leading to lower inflows into Lake Powell. And I so to show, this is having two effects. The lake elevation is dropping. That's resulting in higher water temperatures, which is what was driving those increased metabolic costs and reduced growth. And um, there's some indication that the phosphorus concentration coming out of the dam is, is lower um, due to the low inflows, and that's influencing prey availability. So let's look at the Perea and LCR monsoon frequency first. Here's what the middle of Marble Canyon looks like when the pre is flooding. It's pretty turbid and it's pretty obvious that a sight feeding fish like rainbow trout, um, and here's some pictures of them in Glen Canyon, is gonna struggle to uh, capture drift under these conditions. And that's why our reactive distance or turbidity was such a strong effect on growth. If you look at the interannual estimates or trend in sediment supply from these tributaries, you can see that the period when we did our study 
had relatively frequent and, um, you know, or, or large amounts of sediment from the Priya coming in compared to, let's say, a period in the early 2000s. And so these, these, these occasional floods are having a significant effect on growth. Um, with respect to inflows, this upper left graph and the drought shows the annual inflows in terms of like billions of uh, cubic meters of water entering between 96 and 2016, shown by the bars. The drought started in 2000. Reservoir inflows declined dramatically. There's, a bit of, there's been a few decent water periods, but they're characterizing this whole thing as drought. And the black line represents the soluble reactive phosphorus concentrations, SRP, coming out of Glen Canyon Dam. So you can see that when the inflows drop, so do the SRP concentrations. When the inflows were covered, SRP concentrations went up. So if we look at the relationship between SRP and the drift densities we've measured, um, we see this you know, limited number of points, but a really strong relationship. So between 2012 and 2015, phosphorus concentrations dropped, so did our drift densities, and you saw what the consequences were to somatic growth rates and abundance. So this you know, plot is probably like not a surprise for us in the Pacific Northwest. We're used to working in oligotrophic systems. You know, it's, this isn't at the top of ecologists' minds in the American Southwest. I mean, frankly, even Carl and I weren't really, you know, Carl wasn't talking a lot about nutrients when we first got started here. So this, uh, you know, is sort of, was a bit counterintuitive down there, even though it shouldn't have been. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the water temperature, which is another interesting story. So this panel on the left, the blue line just shows the elevation of Lake Powell. Drought started in 2000, inflows drop, lake elevation declined dramatically. And as you can see, when that happened, the water temperatures popped up, typically in the fall, that you know they were averaging eight to 10 degrees, 11, and, and then they rose up to peaks of like 14 to 16. So what's going on there is as the lake elevation drops, um, the surface and metalimnetic waters get closer to the depth of the penstock. And so some of that warmer surface water is entrained into the penstocks, and that's what causes this dramatic temperature increase. Now you'd think 14, 16 degrees, that's near optimal for trout growth. Um, and, and you know we have the lab experiments showing relationships between water temperature and trout growth. And they typically follow this dome-shaped pattern where initially the you know, digestion metabolism is inefficient at low temperatures and that limits growth. There's an optimum. And then as you keep increasing the temperatures, the metabolic costs um, out what, you know, are, are too high and so growth rate declines. The key thing about these relationships is that the thermal optima varies with the prey density. So when you've got low prey, the optima will occur at a lower uh, water temperature. And in Glen Canyon, because, and Grand Canyon, because prey densities are generally low, we're for the most part on this um, descending limb of this curve. And that's why our, our model is showing negative effects of increasing temperature. So to wrap up, um, the growing conditions of Trout and Grand Canyon um, strikingly determine their abundance through their effects on survival rates of adults, um, maturation schedules, fecundity, and juvenile recruitment. And you know, this is a really uh, strong example of how that works. There's, there's really strong bottom-up control of trout growth in the system, driven by reservoir inflows, um, principally drought in this case, and tributary floods um, as determined by the frequency of monsoons. Competition was also an important variable, right? It allowed growth rates to recover in the absence of improvements in prey and, and magnified the negative effects of some of these non-optimal -opti bottom-up conditions early in the time period. So a, a really interesting result of this, going back to our original question, um, is that the downstream extent of rainbow trout, like in terms of how far they move towards the LCR, is quite a dynamic uh, process and ultimately driven by climate. And so during periods of high reservoir inflows and limited monsoons, and we had uh, a couple of periods like that over the last 20 years, um, the trout population is going to be able to expand into more downstream locations be the, because the conditions down there will allow them to sustain themselves because they'll have good growth rates. 
But when those growth rates degrade, um, that population due to turbidity, warm temperatures, low prey, that population is going to have to, it basically retracts upstream because it can no longer be supported down there. Um, so there's a few implications of all this with respect to adaptive management in this system and more broadly. Um, the work has like brought up a couple of new potential policies. One is if you wanted to make bigger trout in Glen Canyon, fertilization might be an effective way to get the gamerous back and grow bigger trout. And uh, that's something we hadn't thought of before. Um, and it really could be thought of as kind of a drought mitigation. Um, the other, and you know, working with Ken Ashley, uh, potentially in terms of at least getting that idea on, onto the table so managers can consider. Um, and so Ken's doing some preliminary loading calculations and such. And the other policy is that um, floods in the fall are commonly carried out when the Priya is running or following when it's run to uh, build beaches. And um, one of the things that does is it takes sediment off the bed, pushes it onto the bars or pushes it downstream. And so after the flood, the water's a lot clearer. Then if you hadn't had the flood and just left that sediment on the bed, you would be increased, the turbidity would be higher and that could limit trout. So a policy here is potentially when there are a lot of trout in Marble Canyon, because there's been a big dispersal event and you have the opportunity to do a flood, um, don't do it. Um, that's not a popular alternative uh, because there's a lot of interest in doing floods um, for other reasons. Um, I would say, standing back more broadly, like we underestimate the effort needed to evaluate adaptive management experiments. So, you know, the most simple minded view would be let's, we've been measuring catch per effort of trout. Um, we've got a good baseline. Let's change the flows in some way and see if trout catch per effort goes up. The challenge there is if it does or doesn't go up, your inference about your treatment effect is really weak. Um, if it did go up, you don't really understand why it went up, and therefore, if your treatment was the cause of the effect that you saw. So I, I'd argue that to, for a strong inference, you really want to understand why abundance is changing. Um, and the other real complication that haunts this adaptive management program in Glen Canyon and others is that there are slow changing climate driven factors such as the ones I've talked about and they confound and complicate the interpretation of shorter time scale adaptive management experiments focused let's say on some aspect of dam operations um, and it becomes very hard to tease out those two factors so the idea is to come up with an experimental design that will take that into account those designs sometimes would have to run 20 years or more and there's a lot of resistance to trying to sell an experiment that might work, but it's going to take 20 years. Um, and so I'm suggesting here that an alternate or complementary approach is to have um, better data-driven models, like the ones I've described, where you can still implement your experiment, but you now have a much better tool to tease out the climate versus treatment effect and therefore, you know, make stronger inferences. Um, and with that, I am uh, done. Thanks for your attention. Yeah, thanks very much, Josh. Great talk. Um, we'll open it up for questions here. Yeah. Well, the old the old man's got a leap in there on one thing. One of the early discussions when we were first starting to work down there, there's been some guys who'd been working on the trout in Glen Canyon for a long time, a guy named McWinney and another one named Persons. And one of the things these guys had noticed was the amphipod decline associated with the declining growth and uh, or declining size like, like you, you talked about. But their conclusion and our ecosystem modeling that we did supported that conclusion was that the reason the amphipods are low in Glen Canyon isn't nothing to do with phosphorus, it's that they're basically being overexploited by that high density trout population. And that's what's keeping the amps from getting bigger. <laughs> they just get nuked. So the right. model said that, that fertilization basically wouldn't do any good at all. It was, I, the counter I'd have to that is, how do you explain like in, in the LCR in the lower marble canyon reaches, our trout densities down there were 20 or 30 times lower, 
right? And so yeah. we have had periods of trout densities that are as low as they were probably in the 80s and early 90s. So well, the aft drifting down there do get a chance to survive a bit longer and grow. So you, they probably are getting more amps down there. They are, but we're, we're not seeing, you know, we did have some, you know, occasional 30, 35 centimeter trout down there, even 40 centimeter trout. And when we recapture them, they were still maxing at, at 20 times lower the density. They were still, their asymptotic size wasn't what it used to be. Yeah, no, no, it's just, this is just an argument about asymptotic size in the, in the Glen Canyon reach above the oh. ferry. I, right. I'm just but, saying that, that that will probably not improve with fertilization. You well, know, I something else you, some... could you reflect for just a second on, on something else that you haven't told us people about here is, Josh, one of the other things that goes on in that system is they fluctuate the river diurnally for power production reasons. And they've had experiments where they've flattened the river out for months at a time. And some of Josh's early work showed really neat, interesting effects of how much diurnal fluctuation there is on the survival of the trout juveniles. You want to comment on that at yeah, all? Yeah, I, I do. So this is, I, I left the slide out because this talk was a bit long, but this black line just shows the catch per effort in mm -hmm. tailwater reach and uh, in relation to reservoir elevations and discharge. But our interpretation when Carl came on the scene um, and, and there's other people he mentioned, Ted and Bill, was that this increase over the 90s in abundance was related to the fact that they, they reduced the hourly variation of flow and that led to more juvenile recruitment and that led to, you know, increasing densities and greater competition, um, which, uh, which then led to smaller fish size. We look at this relationship now knowing that the reservoir was rising, uh, releases were higher, that although the phosphorus measurements were, um, aren't available during this period or really uh, the detection limit is too low, this was probably also a period of, of increasing or high phosphorus levels. So I interpret this as like, I think we, we maybe overestimated the importance of flow fluctuations and, under, and, and that the gamma's population was already kind of in, the, was, you know, it, it's a bit confounded, but basically uh, the gamma's, you know, you're saying that the, the gamma's population was devastated by this increase in abundance. Yeah, the gamma's data from that early period show it not increasing when other things did the early drift data. So it is acting even back where your, where your red spot is there as the population started to build up. Gammas did not build up during that period. They stayed low. It went lower even. Indicative of over-exploitation because the system was more productive then. Yeah. They just weren't able to take advantage of it, I think. Right. Okay. I mean, I'm not sure how great the data is over that period, but yeah, no, it's I think the I think the response to fertilization would is uncertain. Um, I, the, the data is not great. I mean, I think it's, it, it'd be an easy way to figure it out, you know, right? With the yeah. you know, fertilization, we could see does does changing to offer a base food base, um, you know, because the algal community has changed. That may be related to the phosphorus levels. I'm not I'm not 100 percent certain of this, of course. It's well, the thing is that you've just identified the next big experiment they need to do, which is fertilization, and that is so cool. <laughs> I think I think it's worth a shot, and I think it could be done at a small enough scale. I mean, that we could we could sort out. But it, it, it's kind of interesting that that we interpreted this as a flow effect due to flow stabilization um, and 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 some higher volume of water, which made the habitat better. Um, and now we're looking at it as thinking like. There may have been a quality of water thing going on here too, and a yeah, big effect driving prey availability beyond the com competitive effects. And I guess it's just it's the insight from the intensively studied period here that lets us look back. For example, we're pretty confident that this decline here is exactly what happened to what I just described in 12 to 16. Mm -hmm. um, but so it you know detailed studies can help you interpret the past. And if we go one more decade earlier, you know, 
it's it's we're a little less certain about you know the original thinking that this is all diol variation i guess um and i think that beauty mm -hmm. fertilization is that you know it's it, it can be done it doesn't take water which is a tough thing to get in the drought and so i i you know be an interesting thing to tease out my colleagues a little less interested than i am in it Anyway. Yeah, just one, one more comment there. Well, over on the left side of that graph, before, we're right where the trout bottom out there. Before then, the diurnal flow fluctuation was from about 1,000 to 20,000 CFS every day and night. They're basically, you couldn't get wild spawning at all until you hit that blue period. Yeah. Rainbow trout could not spawn successfully, period. So they were maintained entirely by stocking before then. And, and the other thing is we have had periods, Carl, of low prey available, of low trout densities, you know, and there's one out here. We haven't seen a recovery of the gamerous during periods when the trout, you know, following these, we've had two of these collapses. It's not like the gamerous started just showing up. Maybe there's a delay due to the life cycle, you know, but we've They're not productive. years of low density, no gamerous. Yeah. And perhaps it's, some combination like you have low nutrients and so the trout population collapses and and then the gamers can't respond because the, the phosphorus levels are still too low. Um, but I do, I'm struck by the fact that we haven't seen prey increases with following population collapses. And, and that's um, really evident in something like, uh, yeah, I mean, we could do it there or we could, maybe that's the easiest you know so you have a population collapse here and um oh maybe it's on this one you know and what we see is like if if you look for example when the population collapsed here you can see competition is reduced that's why all these gray bars are up there but i don't see big green spikes right in other words the prey availability stayed low even though there was a reduction in competition I got a question, Josh. Um, or, or first of all, there may be some other people with questions. So, yeah, uh, before I ask a question, I'd, I'd like to see if uh, anybody else would like to. Hey, I have a question. This is Chris Cahill. Good talk, Josh. Hey, Chris. Um, so, can you go forward one slide? <laughs> uh, yeah, that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, one of the things that I was confused uh, about when you were showing this was that you show that the foods are declining right? The food availability, the green bars in that first section, yeah. like the first three bars on the left. And you show that the competition is staying about the same. And I'm sure you've thought of this, but it just strikes me like I used to work in Arctic lakes where, you know, the food supplies diminish throughout the season. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just wondering how you separate those effects in, your, in, in terms of what you're seeing. And probably you've thought of this. It's just something that struck me when I was watching your talk. Um, well, yeah, I think in this system, right, we, we get a reduction in, in uh, midges and black claws because of the seasonal timing of their reproduction, right? So they typically, I think this September period to January period is always low for food because of, of that aspect. Um, so the, all the model does is it just says we measured the food was lower and the model says that that's part of the, that's a, that's part of the reason why the growth rates are reduced. For sure, and I guess I'm just wondering if it's a chicken and the egg argument, right? Because you've got competition and you've got food in the model. And so if I, I'm just trying to tell like whether the, the prey availability is low because the number of trout in that section or whatever reduced the prey availability through time or whether it's truly like a bottom up kind of influence where the prey right. availability is actually declined. I guess that's maybe better phrased. <laughs> yeah, and I would just say that during periods of, I'd go back to like when the population collapsed, right? We didn't see a release of the prey. So, gotcha. you know, like that, talking expect. about like slide, slides, like, so here are low competition, reduced co half the competition level, almost no fish down there. And yet uh, then I would expect to see a bunch of positive green bars if it top down effect on prey. I, I, I think of the, um, I guess that would have, I mean, that kind of assumes it would happen immediately. I'm not sure. Well, anyway, years. Okay. I need to think about that, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, I think there is, de decoupling that is, is a challenge, but I mean, I, I just do look at the fact that we had, you know, two years of sustained low abundance due to the lags with recruitment and no recovery of prey over that period. 
Um, to me, I mean, I think, I, so I interpret the competition as not depleting the total available food supply. There's local depletion in foraging areas and there's interference competition pushing fish into like less optimal habitats. That's how competition is affecting growth as, as opposed to hammering the overall food supply. Um, All right. But I, I, you know, I, I don't think we have that nailed. I think it's a it's sort of a fair point. And the no, it's not a it's not a criticism. I was just confused when I saw it. Um, I was just very interested. It's really cool data. And the other thing I guess I would I would say, Chris, is this relationship um, here. I mean, granted, there's not a lot of data points, but if there was a ton of top down control of prey, and this is not measured in foraging arenas, this is measured kind of in the thalwag. So if, 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 if high densities upstream, you know, um, we're depleting things, um, why would phosphorus be such a, have such a strong influence on the prey density? Like I, you know? Mm. I guess you know, that's coronamid prey you're looking at there in the drift biomass. <clears throat> right. I had, a, I had a question. Um, yeah, it seems like gammas is really quite an important component of this system, and you're making some speculations on gammas. Uh, why would you not consider formulating a, let's say, a, a population dynamics model for for gammas, which would be a function of like suitable habitat variation, available habitat, and uh, let's say cropping and nutrients, and, and and have some independent model just to to see how how that would predict how gammas would vary over time. There could be multiple alternative hypotheses, but it seems like that's an important one. And and when you yeah. talk about nutrients like phosphorus, well, okay, that that's drift as Carl pointed out. We don't even like. Uh, I think there should be some understanding of which nutrients complex is is good for gammas. Uh, so I think there's a whole variety of factors, you know, not just cropping and so on, uh, that that sh uh, could be considered. What have you thought about like maybe developing a population dynamics model for gammas? See how it works in the system. We did. Yeah, it'd be great. It would be a great thing to do. I mean, it's, it'd be data limited at this point, but I think we could probably learn things through the modeling exercise um, for sure. We right? did. We actually did model that as a population dynamics model, and that's where I got that it would not recover that quickly. It's not a productive species. It's the same issue in BC interior trout lakes. So you're saying it, 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 it doesn't, it's, a, it's got a low R kind of thing, a low... Oh, you bet, it's an annual species. It, it's not productive at all. And, you know, people have seen this up in the interior lakes in BC with rainbows too. So you've got to keep the rainbow density way down in order for them to have scuds to eat and to grow really big. And as soon as the rainbow populations come up, that they crash the... Yeah. The scuds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I, all I can say is that the, uh, you know, there's definitely been a change in the parapite community from one dominated by Cladophora and then diet ad, non adenate diatoms on that Cladophora and then the, and then the gammas grazing that. That's, that's kind of how the, the, you know, food web's been described there uh, in early work. And now it's, you know, much more dominated by, uh, uh, of species like Cara and aquatic macrophytes and lots of mosses, you know? And so I'm also uh, another hypothesis with respect to gammas is like, can they do as well with that different type of, and, and one of the reasons for that vegetation and paraphyton shift may be also related to nutrient levels, right? As you know, the macrophytes are taking over perhaps because phosphorus levels in the water are so, so low, it makes more sense to get your nutrients for macrophytes, I can get it from the sediment, you know? And so there's a lot of hypotheses about what could be controlling gamma. So I agree, Murdoch, it would be, you know, I'm not sure if the data is good enough to get a lot of insights from the modeling, but maybe, I mean, as always, you would get some. Maybe it's worth revisiting the model that Carl brought up. Yeah. I just want to get Just, I think, it, I, think okay. just, I think it's a good opportunity to check into a question for Carl. Carl. Is your data still shit? What's your <laughs> not Josh's. Everybody else's is, but not Josh's. You just saw. Uh, it's hard to visualize. You saw a lot of data. Just how much work that was, and what a reputation Josh has got 
as the worst slave driver research leader in the entire history oh. of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and, I blame and, and that guy. Nobody else could have done that. I blame this guy. But, but uh, I will say that, you know, when you're spending a lot of money and effort like this, um, there's a lot of haters. And uh, uh, because they all want that money to do their little things. And so people, the typical reaction to this was, this is too detailed. Like what we, you know, this is, but yet I, I look back at it now, like what with this data analyzed and saying, no, you need a lot of effort to make strong inference in big systems, you know? And unfortunately there's not a lot of resources are going around where all disciplines can do this. So it's up to leadership, which is sometimes weak to decide what the stakeholders really need to know, make big investments in those projects and stop spreading it around to a bunch of things that aren't really that relevant to decision making, you know? Um, that's my view on it, anyways. So we've run over time a bit. Uh, that was a fantastic talk. Oh. Thanks again, Josh. Um, with regards to, let's say, uh, invertebrate populations like Gamerous, uh, we know that, let's say, habitat complexity is, is to some extent an issue. Like, we can have really high densities of of trout in some interior lakes, and yet still there's a pretty high uh, gamerous density uh, in some of these lakes, even though there's really high stocking. And um, you know there are a whole variety of reasons uh, for why that uh, gamerous density and availability may vary. Um, but to what extent, like, uh, has let's say the uh, benthic uh, habitat uh, varied over time, like um, in terms of uh, let's say the, you know, the bottom, like uh, you know, let's say the benthic structure like rocks and, and vegetation like oh. that must be uh, varying quite a bit uh, with the flow variations and so on like sedimentation oh, you're, there's a huge change happening you're absolutely murdoch um a huge change that we don't understand what's happening but it has gone from so during this period that carl measured in the early there was big big natural flooding in the late mid late 80s they almost lost the dam. It's kind of a famous story where the lake was so full it was almost filling over the top. They had to put plywood up there. Anyways, they had to release a lot of water and it, it just basically cleaned out all the Grand Canyon. And um, at that, you know, it recovered into its classic cl rocks in Grand Canyon covered with cladophora, diatoms, midges, and blackflies. And over time with the flow stabilization, what's gone on is, um, little bits of fine sediment that come in there have built up and the macrophyte community is built. And, and now what you see is a completely different looking system where during the spring or summer through late fall, it's almost impossible to park your boat because there's macrophytes everywhere. Um, and the bottom, instead of being dominated by this, you know, green filamentous algae that was quite productive, is now dominated by moths. You know, so the, so the macrophytes, I think, and the moss probably provide an opportunity for gamerous to be less vulnerable to predation. They may be entrained in the drip less, um, and, and the steadier flows also may reduce their attainment. So I think their habitat for the bugs has changed a lot. And so I think that the question is, what's driving that change in the macrophyte and paraphyte community? Is, is an important question. And, and the, this fish that Mike Yard is holding there, that big brown trout, those things used to be a couple of percentage of, of percent, a few percent of the catch. Those are now like in Glen Canyon, about 20% of the catch and rising, right? So in Glen? Is really expanding. Uh, uh, the least ferry reach? Yes. Or for 30% on the last trip, like, so, so these browns are, are coming up. They're piscivorous, obviously. They're able to better benthically forage. Their flesh is orange. They are able to get at gamerous because they're able to root around in those macrophytes and their jaws will, the lower jaws will often be worn, are pretty strong evidence of they're better able to benthically forage. And um, we're not really sure what's causing that, that change, but the whole, you know, the, it's a great concern because those things could, in other tailwaters, they don't always balance out and the brown trout can kind of decimate the rainbows. If they move downstream, they can cause bubbles for native fish. They're so much more piscivorous than rainbows. Um, 
So a uh, question for us is are those macrophyte changes or productivity changes like part of the reason why we're seeing more brown trout. So it's going to be a pretty exciting next 10 years if we can keep going to see what let this me, uh, Let me interject here something about this nutrient in the phosphorus loading increase and so on. When we were doing the original adaptive management modeling exercises, there was a woman who was monitoring Lake Powell levels and nutrient concentrations named Susan Hayfellow. Susan was not well liked in the program. She was pretty aggressive and but, uh, uh, trying to promote her studies and nobody else wanted to support them. Susan actually brought this hypothesis forward. She said, as the reservoir levels go up, phosphorus concentrations are much higher in the deep water of the reservoir than at the surface. Uh, we should see a positive relationship between nutrient loading below, below the dam into the river and, uh, and reservoir levels. And she tried to get support to work on that, but her personality basically yeah. caused people to discount everything she said. They eventually huh. drove her out of the program. Huh. Uh, I tried to get a little bit of modeling support for her and it, it damn near cost me uh, my contacts in the canyon to promote her at, at all. Oh, really? <laughs> oh yeah, things got pretty nasty there at one point because they were determined to get rid of Susan. And they did, and they replaced her with a complete idiot. Right. Yeah, and, and consequently, we had like below detection issues, you know, that have now really hurt us. And we go back and try to look at the phosphorus, for, relate phosphorus and other nitrogen and such to other things. Um, you know, so that's, that's yeah. I mean, you know, Charles and Bridget now are trying to work better understand what's controlling phosphorus levels. Um, but you know, the historical data set is only so good because I hadn't realized because of that history. Yeah, no, it's just one of those examples in adaptive management where you really miss the ball by because of just bloody personality problems in the modeling and data collection team early on. That's interesting, Carl. I wish I, I should have invited some of my Grand Canyon folks on here they yeah, they won't admit any of this. Like Mike Yard in your picture there, Mike did, it was not a supporter of, uh, of the Heffalong. He's a huge, but I think he's always been really interested in the reservoir dynamics. But it, yeah, 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 but not but, not in not in her work. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. I didn't I didn't quite realize that. Huh. Yeah. Well, I think I think I don't know. Actually, I'm not sure about Mike, but certainly the administration in uh, GCMRC was not supportive of her. Hmm. So the brown trout, wouldn't it be seen to be more of a pest species with regards to that chub? Because- uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It is feared, like they, they're super concerned about it. But, um, you know, the, the anglers in Lee's Ferry, most of them look at it. This is the only trophy sized fish opportunities available to them. So good until it eats all their rainbows which may, or may not happen um so you got this huge conflict and then you've got the uh, you know chub folks who are absolutely fearing this and want to remove every one of these fish for a while we had, we were we were forced to remove all these things um every one we caught until we tried to con convince them that it would be better to know a little bit more about their survival and movement if they let us tag them um and then we could use that tagging data to evaluate the effectiveness of a removal program so there's a huge conflict over these things, but I have a feeling that these things are going to do what they're going to do because, um, you know, it's, it's just hard to control populations in big systems. And especially if there's some fundamental like climate or nutrient or, or vegetation driver, if you could figure out why these things are on the rise, um, it would be very valuable. Okay. So thanks again, Josh. Uh, oh yeah.